All right, we made it to the end of Unit 2, and today we're going to review intelligence and achievement as we wrap up cognition. Now remember, even though this is the last topic review video of the unit, you still have my Unit 2 practice exam in the Exam Slayer, and my Unit 2 summary video that covers the entire unit all in one video, both of which will make sure that you are prepared for your unit exam or that AP test in May. But more on that later on. Right now, you need to take out your guided notes and we need to review Unit 2, Topic 8. Okay, so when talking about intelligence, we have to start by highlighting that psychologists and people have been debating for years what intelligence really is. Generally, we can see intelligence is defined as the ability to learn from experiences, adapt to new situations, solve problems, and apply knowledge in a variety of different contexts. But the details of what counts as intelligent behavior and how to measure it are definitely up for debate. Different definitions influence how intelligence tests are designed, how results are interpreted, and how people are ultimately labeled in our schools, places of work, and society in general. Now, in looking at intelligence, we can see that some people believe in a single intelligence, also known as a person's general ability, or G for short. According to this view, people who perform well on one type of cognitive task are likely to perform well across many other tasks. Essentially, there's one underlying general intelligence factor, and that is what influences all other mental tasks performed by the individual. On the other hand, other individuals have argued that intelligence isn't just one overall ability, but in fact it's made up of distinct multiple skills. People who argue that intelligence is comprised of multiple abilities focus on the fact that individuals who may be weak in one area in life can still be strong in another. For instance, you may be terrible at math, like me, but be a phenomenal painter or writer. So we can see that intelligence is hard to actually define. It's abstract, and it's not like you can see it or easily measure it. If we go back to the early 1900s, we can see the first formal intelligence test was created by Alfred Binet, who introduced the concept of an IQ. Binet's test compared a child's mental age, which is the level of performance they showed on tasks, with their chronological age, their actual age in years. A typical child would score close to 100 since their mental age and chronological age would be about the same. Now, Bennett never claimed that intelligence was fixed. His original goal of creating this test was to identify students who needed extra support in school. Over time, however, others adapted and expanded Bennett's work, transforming it into an assessment for intelligence of individuals across all ages. This new version quickly spread throughout the United States and was applied in school workplaces, the military, and even the government. What began as a diagnostic tool to help struggling students turned into a method of labeling people's potential. Today, people have criticized many traditional intelligence tests due to cultural bias, with people saying that some test questions may assume prior knowledge that are more familiar to certain cultural groups over others, resulting in skewed results favoring certain groups of people. Some individuals are working to create intelligence assessments that are so socio-culturally responsive in order to try and minimize bias and reduce negative impacts, such as the stereotype threat or stereotype lift. The stereotype threat is the fear or anxiety that an individual may feel when they are at risk for conforming to negative stereotypes about their social group. While on the other hand, the stereotype lift is when an individual benefits from positive stereotypes about their group. Both of these concepts can impact how an individual performs on an assessment and can lead to inaccurate results. To try and make sure that test results are meaningful, psychologists must make sure that the intelligence test and really to be fair, any psychological test, adhere to three psychometric principles, at least if the results are to be considered useful. The first is standardization. A test is standardized when it is given under the same conditions to everyone, using the same directions, timing, scoring, and procedures. This helps reduce bias and allows for a fair comparison to be made. The second is validity, and a test is valid if it measures what it's actually supposed to measure. Now, we can actually break validity down into four different types. The first is content validity, which is the extent to which a test inquires about the information 
information or behaviors that are of interest to the test. Next is construct validity, which is the degree in which a test can actually measure a specific trait or concept. This essentially ensures that the test accurately measures a specific concept or trait that it's supposed to do. Then there is criterion validity, which checks to see if the test correlates with any outside variables or measures. If this is low, the test may not be valid. And lastly, predictive validity, which predicts future performance. This validity only is used when there is a large data set, and it's used to predict trends and patterns. Now, the third and last standard that a test must have is reliability. If a test is reliable, it produces consistent results each time it is given. This means if you take the test multiple times, the score should be similar. Now, for AP Psychology, there's two types of reliability that you want to be familiar with. The first is test retest reliability which refers to the consistency of a test results over time, meaning that the same person should receive similar scores when taking the test on multiple occasions. The second type is split half reliability, which refers to the consistency of results within the test itself, such as comparing the results from two halves of the same test. This method allows researchers to see if test takers do better on one part of the test compared to the other part. Ideally, there should be a high correlation between the two parts of the test. This would show that the test is correlated with itself. Speaking of results, we can also see that IQ scores around the world have actually increased over time, and this is known as the Flynn effect. This increase in IQ scores over time isn't because people are just naturally smarter now. This phenomenon is due to the fact that people now have greater access to education, healthcare, and more nutritious foods. These environmental influences have influenced intelligence scores, showing that the environment does play a role in the nature versus nurture discussion. Now, when looking at IQ scores, research has shown that there is a greater difference in scores within a group than between groups. This means that if you take 100 students who are randomly chosen from one group, let's say the senior class from your school, you will see a wide range of IQ scores. This range of scores inside the group will most likely be larger than the average differences when comparing across different groups such as the other grades in your school. This means that individual differences within a group are more significant than the average differences between groups, highlighting the importance of not making assumptions about a person's intelligence based solely on the person's group identity. All right, so we can see that even if intelligence tests may appear to be objective, there still is a chance that a person's culture and bias may be impacting the test, the results, and unfortunately, how the results are interpreted. For example, when creating an intelligence test, a person may assume that certain vocabulary is commonly known. However, in reality, it may only be more common for certain cultural groups, giving them an unfair advantage over other individuals. Environmental barriers such as poverty, societal discrimination, and educational inequalities also all impact an individual. Individuals growing up in poverty often have limited access to books, early childhood education, and technology. They also also are more likely to be in stressful environments, which can impact memory and concentration. Individuals who face discrimination can be impacted as well by the stereotype threat, which can reduce their opportunities in life and reduce their test scores. Lastly, individuals growing up in lower income areas typically attend schools that are underfunded, resulting in individuals having less access to certain resources in their classrooms, less challenging courses in their schools, and possibly less experienced teachers. Again, this just highlights why the IQ score should not be seen as a fixed score that measures someone's worth or potential. Now, since we've been talking so much about testing a person's IQ, we also need to talk about the different tests individuals often take. The first is an achievement test, and this is a test that measures what someone has already learned. These tests focus on knowledge and skills that a person has gained through instruction, like attending classes at school. For example, at the end of this unit, you'll most likely take a unit exam, which seeks to measure what you learned in this unit. And that would be an example of an achievement test. Which, of course, remember, if you do need help studying for it, you can check out my exam Slayer, which has a full unit practice exam, AAQ help, and an exam simulator that breaks down your results so you know exactly where you need to study. Now, the other type of test you may experience in life is an aptitude test. And these are used to predict a person's ability to learn new information or perform in the future. Here, the 
focus is on potential instead of current knowledge. Examples of aptitude tests include the ACT, SAT, IQ tests, and career aptitude tests, all of which seek to look into the future to see what you can do. Just remember that achievement tests look at what you know now, and aptitude tests look at what you are capable of learning later on. All right, now when it comes to intelligence, we can see that there is a debate on if intelligence is fixed or fluid. Individuals who believe that a person's intelligence is fixed believe in a fixed mindset, which is the belief that intelligence is unchangeable. So intelligence is something that you were born with. For instance, if you truly think that you were just bad at math, you are demonstrating a more fixed mindset, assuming that no amount of practice or effort can really help you out. Unfortunately, you're just terrible at math, and that's how it is, and that's how it will always be. On the other hand, the belief that intelligence is malleable and that it can grow and improve with effort and support is an example of a growth mindset. People with a growth mindset often view the brain as a muscle. When you practice and review, you strengthen the brain. If we go back to us being bad at math, a person with a growth mindset might realize that they struggle in math, but they understand that they can improve through studying and reviewing. Which mindset you have impacts not only your academic achievement, but your motivation as well. Generally, individuals who believe intelligence can grow are more likely to take challenges, continue to find solutions, and perform better over time. Okay, well there you have it. You are done with Unit 2. Now you need to watch the Unit 2 summary video and check out the Unit 2 practice exams inside the exam slayer. Remember, the important thing with those practice exams is the result page. You want to make sure you look at the breakdown of your scores so you can see exactly where you need to study. And this will allow you to save time and do better on your actual test in class. You can find the link for it in the description below. As always, I'm Mr. Sin. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time online.